it. Hello, another Café Rollist and the last of our series dedicated to Road to Session Zero Con. Uh, we are Thursday and it's happening this Saturday, January 30th. Everybody, please, if you have not yet registered to that event and come join us in the beautiful 2D world. I think just walking around the convention is going to be sort of a game. I think there's even a, a treasure hunt, but more about that uh, in a minute. I am joined today by the mother. Hello, how are you? Oh, hi. Um, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. It's, it's pretty good weather today. <laughs> great. W where are you based, actually? Oh, uh, I'm I'm in Davao City. That's in Davao del Sur. We're kind of like in the Mindanao region. So like in the Philippines, there's like three regions. Uh, Luzon, where the capital is, Manila. And then Visayas, and then Mindanao. So I'm in the south side. Cool. Uh, what does your, we, we got two ice breaking questions on the re, cafe released. Uh, what is your routine like at the moment? What, what do you do? What time do you wake up and what's the first thing you do and how does your day goes? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I'm a bit of a workaholic, so I'm a bit ashamed <laughs> of explaining my routine. Uh, but I do have a graveyard shift. Uh, so usually um, when I wake up, usually it's around noon because like i would sleep around seven or eight uh, after the shift so usually my day starts at noon or around the afternoon and the first thing i do when i wake up is of course take care of my cat overlords i have four cats <laughs> um and then you know after i get things sorted i immediately go uh, to the pc because most of my work is here i immediately check on my community i i'm one of the managers in the community of dudes and dice Davao discord server I try to check on the kids i check on my messages like checking uh, most of the time it's just um making sure everything's all right with the kids sometimes they would share when they see me go online it's like hey ma uh, and you know the usual interactions uh and it depends on the day i almost always have a game run for the day i run a lot of campaigns for newbies so I have three tables for Eberron, so depending if it's a Monday, a Monday or a Saturday or a Tuesday, I run that. And if it's uh, a Wednesday, I do a stream with some friends uh, called Cthulhu. And then um, if it's on a Tuesday, uh, I would do a another campaign with some kids. And if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I run another play by post, so it's like just text space. So I'm doing a lot of uh, game events during the afternoon and then I go to work afterwards. So yeah, um, and that's pretty much most of my day. And uh, in between, I would check on the house and you know do some gardening because we do have some um, this lawn and I'm trying to figure out uh, how to plant more things. Uh, we, we got some like, uh, I, I forgot the English term for it. We have alugbati in lemongrass and stuff like that so yeah. just uh, pretty busy <laughs> so are you one of the founders what, what's the story behind dudes and dice davao or how did it start it and what is it actually um thanks for that great question actually um it's kind of like a funny uh, it's kind of like a funny story to share now looking back because uh when i started out uh 2015 uh, I got in, I, I was invited to play Pathfinder, first ed, <laughs> uh, by a, a writer friend. I was mainly a writer and I was, I was part of a writing group. And then he was like, hey, would you try um, like role play? And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then like I joined and it was like an all guy group. They kind of freaked out, which is weird. Uh, looking back now, it's like, it, it's quite normal now to see girls play. There's a lot of female players now. But back then, when I joined that group, it was like, I'm the only chick there. <laughs> so um, There's a bit more, but was, still not enough. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in my uh, community, there's a lot more girl players. Uh, so that's great. <laughs> and then during that time, 2015, I, I learned Pathfinder. So I went through 3.5 and Pathfinder first. That was my first system. And around 2017, I realized, like, OK, I'm not really into the munchkin play. 
I'm more into the storyline creating worlds, narrative based. You kind of figure out that it's not all about the numbers and trying to get a crit and trying to get all that damage to kill that one thing in one shot. Uh, I kind of asked my friends, like that group, hey, maybe we could open up our tables, the one we open up on Fridays and Saturdays, because like we used to play in this cafe. Um, it, it was owned by an American named Sam, really cool guy. Uh, he let us rent the entire, well, not rent, he just let us stay up there and we get food. And then we play there every Friday and Saturday. And I told them, hey, um, maybe we can open tables to other people. And the first thing they said was, nah, no one's gonna ever, no, one is, no one's interested in this thing. I'm <laughs> like, are you sure? Are you sure there's no one interested in the city? I mean, there's us. And they were like, they had this mindset of, oh, we're the last of our kind because like the fifth Ed came in. <laughs> and oh, I was wow. so confused. I was so confused with that mindset. I, I, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> um, and then as a challenge, I was like, he, it got to a conversation, which is, I always remember, it's like, you're never going to get to 50. You're not even going to get to that number of interested people who's going to play tabletop RPGs. And I was like, okay, is that a challenge? <laughs> so um, I ended up making Dudes and Dice, Dabao. Uh, it started with me and that group, but and it ended up with just me and um, my current boyfriend, who uh, sadly, they, they did not agree to me, like I should open tables to people and run games for people, you know, get them into the hobby. And uh, I called it Dudes and Dice because, you know, the Bonnaker, um, one of the dudes, um, you're like one of the dudes. And I wanted to change the name, like, you know, the, the naming sense changes over time, depending on the use. And I wanted dudes to be like, an all encompassing thing. It's not just a guy thing. It's like girls can be in it, um, non binary can be in it, LGBT can be in it for dudes. So it's like a thing that I did. Because it's funny, because it's dudes and dice, and the main person is a is a female. So it's, a, it's pretty funny uh, when I tried to challenge that. And three years passed, and I were happy, I'm happy to say that we're like already, we beat the 50 number. We're already at 250 players. And wow, 250, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, and it's like a local community and we're, we tapped into other uh, places as well. Like in Manila, I have Manila Den Kids and I have Cebu Den Kids. So it's like, it's really nice that we grew that big because like it was just a matter of openness to get people into the hobby. So did the original members came around the idea of playing other editions of Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> or maybe even other games? uh i haven't heard from them since unfortunately oh okay um, i <laughs> but um i did have some kids in there that um to this day like we tried out starfinder they started trying out a lot of fun things they kind of told me that we had we had the same sentiments we kind of moved out of that group because it was like i mean pathfinder is great and all but if you're just going to one shot that monster it's not fun like we're not going to have fun on the table kind of thing like and it's all about the positive experience so when you say you call them kids, is that a, a nickname or are they literal children? Oh, um, I, I don't know. My, my face froze. <laughs> uh, it, it's on. okay. Things freeze okay, so sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a very maternal figure. I will admit to that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mom friend. There's no denying it. Um, I'm, I'm very caring about my friends. And the people that um, that are under me, under my table, uh, people that I meet, I I have this like very caring personality. So they like, and most of the kids like in the community, because I'm I'm sorry for the ambiance, by the way. <laughs> um, so with the kids, it's like um, they're a lot younger than me. I'm 28, and most of them are in, like college age, 17, 18. Uh, some of them are professionals, like they're at the, their 22s, 23s. Uh, but because of my maternal and caring nature, um, it became very comfortable for them to just see me as a mom figure. And they know that I'm very protective of them. And like, if, if anything happens, like most of the time, uh, there's a joke around the the community where it's like, oh no, mom's coming with the chancla, you know, the chancla, the, the slipper. <laughs> so um, there's that joke that, because I have this like, um, that, that 
loving care, that tough love kind of thing. Like, um, I'm not gonna put up with any um, behavior in the like in the server that if if somebody, uh, but it, but it's all jokes and fun and stuff. So it's like uh, it. I just really like uh, taking care of people. So it wasn't. It didn't feel wrong when um, when younger people would call me mom. But I always ask the older, <laughs> the older people, like um, if they're okay with you know calling me Denma, because like most of, I'm just known as Den Mother. So uh, it's always a conversation of, are you guys cool with you know like you know I don't have to call me that I'm Mars. So um, yeah, it's it just like it it comes like when you get in the community like you understand immediately why like I'm Den Mother. I would immediately greet you and then like ask. If you guys had dinner, <laughs> like I always check on them because sometimes they skip their meals, which I don't like. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's just more of a caring personality, I believe. So how did you manage? I assume I mean I'm not I'm not aware of the the exact situation in, in the the Philippines uh, at the moment, but I presume you moved most of your games online due to the the COVID situation, or did this transition happen? Oh. Um, with, with the COVID situation, we were forced in the, uh, unfortunately we were forced to play online, but, uh, I was already starting it around December. It just didn't pick up until the, the COVID time. We just, and the thing with the server was I wanted it. To be a, like there's a lot of shy kids like i'm in a i'm in a place in like where it's a very conservative place and there's a lot of shy kids and most of and our internet is sorry for the word it's crap <laughs> mm -hmm. and if uh, i kind of found a way where they're very comfortable in doing play by posts and if i can give that to them like if i can like provide a way for them to play without them having to break their comfort zones too much not till they're ready like i gave that to them for during the tech space like the play by posts and that's when the server picked up actually the the only reason why the, the server became that big is because like we partnered up we opened ourselves to a lot of communities that were open as as well as us like rpg sabu they had an event uh, during COVID, and they invited us, and then we helped them out, and that's how we branched out. Checking if it works. Oh, nope, the camera is working again. <laughs> yeah. Yay. <laughs> so yeah. So play by post, post and play via uh, text. Uh, first of all, I think it's getting uh, much more popular recently. And in my last episode, I was interviewing uh, a, t a French team, a Canadian French team uh, developing a tool called Tails, which you can find at mm -hmm. rp.gg uh, slash Tails. Uh, it's linked in the, I linked it in the, the description, which allows this type of um, of game. It's a nice tool. Which I like plugging people, but <laughs> uh, play by post, play by text. It's sort of going full circle towards what brought you to tabletop in the first place, which seems to be writing. So how does your activity as a writer and uh, your hobby in tabletop uh, interact? Yeah, it, it did. Um, one of the like I'm, one of the things I'm very proud about is like how much the text-based scene can still create a lot of reactions. Like um, I had a lot of shy kids. I played Persona. Like I did. The, the way I pulled them in, because they would never try the games, because that's, that's how shy they were. I put them, like, I put a game in a fandom setting. Like, uh, I, I'm currently doing campaigns like Persona and uh, DC Comics, and they create characters in that world, and they use different uh, styles for that. And it, it, seeing them grow out of it, like, the, the shyness, and, like, being very confident with themselves and then becoming part of the community, um, that's always been a great, uh, like, like I realized that it doesn't have to be voice all the time. Like I, I actually started when I started my uh, tabletop um, experiences. I actually started out online because uh, in 2015, because I was in Manila, I was in the capital working, and then the people were in Davao, and then our DM was in our, our GM 
was in Singapore. So I was like, I was already used to the online setup. And then I got into the physical tables around 2017 to uh, 2020 before the COVID thing. And our last game, I believe, was like in Feb. And then we all just moved into the online scene. And the great thing about the that is that everybody started to help each other, like without without me having to say, hey, help them out. Like they were more than willing to help them out transition into the, the tech scene, like, hey, get your character through this bot and and stuff. Like they started to help each other, which was really great because like the online scene helped a lot of kids in their own way because mo everyone's online now. Everybody's cooped up and it's not really nice. But when you find a community that helps you out to, you know, um, try to get your mind off the stress of the day and just be able to play for a bit. It's, it's really great. Like, I do believe PvP is great. Like, I'm glad it's picking up steam. So do, do you help or did any of these kids uh, move into writing and maybe sharing their, their written work, uh, moving, I don't know, like into fan fiction or this sort of thing? I don't know what, what the fan fiction scene is like for, for Persona 5 and, uh, and, and DC in the Philippines. I'm sorry about that. No, don't worry. It's, it's totally fine. Ambience. Yeah, that's um, that's a soundscape, you know. We are, I'm missing recording f at conventions, and when I recall at convention, I got this blanket of soundscapes in the back. I miss that, so it's fine. Yes, you just heard, you just heard a car there. But um, going back to your question about the kids, we actually have this thing called in-character musings. It was started by one of the writers, the main writers in our group. Uh, we have this channel where they write as their characters, their thoughts, their feelings, like a POV. And it's super nice, like seeing how extensive the lore gets. Like that's the most active channel I've seen. And me as a writer, I am so happy that I, I hear kids like, I don't write. Like when you meet them at first, like I don't like writing. I don't want to do writing. But when they got into getting to know their characters, the personality and meeting other people and interacting with them in PvP or in game, they start to write stories, backstories. You suddenly find out, oh, they have a family tree. Oh, suddenly there's like, he's, you find out his backstory that he used to be part of, a, like he was one of the keepers of the gate or some, some stuff. And I'm just like, this is, this is really good stuff. Like I wouldn't even think about that kind of writing and seeing the kids write that. Like, and it's like, it's not just like short sentences, it's like paragraphs, like, wow. And there'd be like chapters it got to the point that there was so much and I'm trying to keep up with all their stories, but I always encourage them to give, like, I always tell them, give me your stories, like, when they're, they're under my table. I want to know what your character is, if you have any notes about them, stories of their past. And they get very engaged about it, like, hey, um, so my character was from Mole Master and, like, he traveled to uh, Silvery Moon and that's where he met. And they're, like, it's seeing that kind of creativity just from the interactions they made even joke characters have backstories like that it's amazing like for me as a writer seeing that and the kids are doing that after a few games it's just great so do these games and writing take place uh, in english or local languages uh, in the in the philippines or both um it's uh, it's actually English most of the time, uh, but we sometimes slip into the vernacular. Like we call Goblin Bisaya, so um, oh he's he's speaking Goblin. <laughs> like sometimes we would blurt out like because we can't help it. It's our it's our mother tongue here, so uh, we would really just suddenly blurt out some kind of you know, oh he's speaking Goblin. <laughs> so it, it just became like the it, it, it's like we got used to doing it in English, but there we do have some significance putting Bisaya in our place. And like most of the time, like when the Davao peeps would talk, um, the Manila kids would be like, what are you guys talking about? Like in out of character, like, or like outside of other chats. And we would like have to explain, oh, okay, um, this is what we were talking about. And then they start to learn our dialect. And oh, that's wow. great. Cause like, you know, they're not just limited to, that's what they, find out words like padayo <laughs> like it got to the point there was like a filipino homework and they were like hey what's what's a bisaya word um for like can you give me a bisaya word because I'm, I'm trying to use it for my homework and and that was like just great because like um sadly in the climate now it's very 
hard for like some folks to get together, especially if they find out like, oh, you're from Mindanao or oh, you're from, from Luzon. Like there's kind of this um, political climate, unfortunately. So seeing the kind of group that can get together and just like, even if with a different dialect, different groups, it's like, if there's an interest, there's no um, hostility towards it. So that that's always great for me. So, and you were telling me, I'm going to have to go look at my uh, dinner, which is uh, stewing right now. But yeah. before I go, I'm going to ask you a question so I can run while you, you fill the gap. Uh, so you were telling me earlier that you're working on your, your own gaming material. Is that an adventure for for Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder? Uh, tell us about it. Oh, stop. Yeah, my... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh it's so, starting to move, uh... so I'm going to be right back. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Uh, save the meal. <laughs> so um, the module that I made, actually, it came from an idea because uh, the kids, the, the ones in my server, they, they, like my, they like After Dark games. So After Dark games is basically you run a game past midnight. We call it After Dark. And it's always, and we like our horror. We like our horror stories. We like spooking each other, like campfire horror stories. <laughs> so and there was this one story um, in our city, uh, in our place, where it's like, oh, did you hear, like, oh, if you make a horror story about Dorian Hotel, and one of the kids challenged me about it. And that was, like, months ago. Like, that wasn't even on my mind that I would end up writing a module about it. Uh, the funny thing was, I was, uh, after I experienced, um, there was a player in the community uh, in the Call of Cthulhu uh, tabletop RPG Philippines, uh, Paolo, he ran Tiempo Muerto, which is a Call of Cthulhu game in the Visayas, the Western Visayas in the 1950s. And for me, that was like, oh my god, that's that's a creepy story, and it's so nice. There's there's like um, there's a there's a horror story in the in the local scene that isn't like just the Manila scene, and that really I gravitated towards that. And he, he kind of tagged me on the last day, <laughs> on the last day that uh, session zero con was closing for the game designers. And I was like, ah, what the heck? I'm going to send my idea. It was still an idea. It wasn't a module yet. So I pitched my idea. I gave my description there. And I was like, I was not expecting a response after that because I don't have like a PDF yet. I didn't have the cover art or whatever. And I just gave my idea. This is like, this is based off an urban legend here. And then I get the email like, hey, you're in. I'm like, oh no, I have two months to write this now. Um, but the kids gave me a great challenge too. Um, basically they got inspired because when I did the game module, they wanted to do game modules too. They wanted to write their own thing now because, oh, Dead Mother's doing a game module now. She's doing a spooky story. She, she, she took my challenge, oh no. So like, I was like, I did this, you better do this too, <laughs> like in the future. So, um, so going back to the thing I wrote, I really love Call of Cthulhu. I'm a very, I'm a horror enthusiast. I that's one of the genres that I believe, like, gets a very visceral, raw human reaction, like, um, and I like that. Uh, some TTRPGs, like, before after Pathfinder, I tried a lot of World of Darkness, uh, vampire games. I ran a lot of it. Then I got to Five E. <laughs> so I I was really into the horror elements, like. Like, like scaring them with consent. <laughs> that's the that's the way I put it. And the, one of the stories here, I find out later on when I was doing my my quick research, I had a friend that's a historian here. There was a lot of like untold stories here in in, in Mindanao. There's a lot of horror stories that's very common to us. Like if we can just share it, but if other people hear it, it's like, how is that real? How is that stuff? And like. Some of the bits and lore that I put in here is actually a mix of urban legend and an actual legit scary thing. Like that's that's something that happened here. And you don't get to read about it in history books. You only get to hear it from the locals. You only get to hear it from like people who tell the story. So I was inspired with a bit of the horror to tell untold stories that were really legit horror stories. Just try to imagine like that actually happening for us that's a normal thing like that's that's oh that happened 
for somebody outside, it's going to be like, what? This is, this is this is something. So I just wanted to create that story, and hopefully after this, now that I have more time, I can do like a Mindanao Gothic where there's a lot more untold horror stories that I can that are modern scenes. They're actually like, I guess, one story I can tell is that without scaring too much of the people, there was this instance where there was a Catholic priest. Uh, since it's called Putu, I'm sorry. Um, content warning, gore. There were two cult brothers who went so mad that they kind of butchered the priest and danced around with his innards. So um, <laughs> that that was an actual legit story. And like you know, you're you're just thinking that that's messed up. That's that's a legit thing. But try to imagine that in a cult to Sulu scene. It kind of works, and you're telling a story, and you're kind of in a way documenting those untold stories because you only hear it through word of mouth and i guess i just wanted to do my own contributions in a sense like starting with a small story that i had and then hopefully in time we'll get to more stories so it just started out as a challenge that turned into something more which i'm very happy about really love how call of tulu uh is a cool setting to be localized. I mean, we have Reign of Terror during the French Revolution. Uh, I know there are more supplements yeah. set in France and Spain, which are coming. There's uh, Berlin Wicked City in the 20s in Berlin, or maybe, uh, yeah, I think it's the 20s. Uh, you got an Harlem Unbound uh, in Harlem in the US, uh, written by a, a black author uh, about uh, black history, which are untold. So I. I think it's great that around the world, uh, Call of Duty inspires people to uh, to write about their, their own area and their own untold stories. Uh, yeah. When um, when is I'm, it going to be available? You, so will it be available by this Saturday? You think? And where will it be available? Um, the, I have the PDF already. Like I already have it written. I am planning, there's um, there's this thing called a Miskatonic Repository Circle. I'm hoping to submit it there after the Saturn Zero Con. Um, and maybe like after all the amount of play tests, because I really care about the input of the players. Um, the, the story that I have in my mod went through a lot of revisions because I really care about feedback. So I want by the time it gets to the repository circle or if it gets to other publishers that it's like it's something that's that not only gives a like a, an experience to the local scene no one feels too alienated because like uh, one of the worries i have which is valid when you're posting these kinds of things not everybody has a different kind of version of their horror like a, a horror version for us is like superstitious spook factors you see, like, just seeing something you're not supposed to see already freaks us out. For somebody outside, it's just like, okay, it, it's, it's probably something um, like a trick of the eye or, like, there's always r rationality or logic and they're not easily phased. So it's like, how would you introduce, like, folk or, like, something rural horror that's very horror to us to a global scene? So I think... I hope that somehow like th it would be treated as its own thing like i didn't want to make it too um like westernized just to make it spooky so i just wanted to keep the flavor of it and that's kind of like one of the worries why i don't want to publish it yet <laughs> like but then again i think once i get like more reception for from the players and with this event thankfully like they gave me like they gave me this opportunity I can finally publish it somewhere like either HIO or the repository circle. Yeah, I'm about to try to publish my own my own first uh, gaming content. It's it's a it's a full mini game, but uh, yeah, I was advised by Jason Pitre, who have a, a rather cool game design launcher. I recommend you you join it and any anyone uh, into game design watching this, uh, the Jason Pitt game design launcher is, is really cool and entirely free to join and it's uh, it's just an open forum for people to to chat and discuss uh, the, their work and uh, bring questions. But uh, what they were telling me is how each actually is a, is a place for development 
people there apparently are very open to unfinished projects and by publishing a first version there, then a second, then a third, you can actually use the platform itself to to progress with you, with your project. So at first, I, I really pictured releasing something quite finished. Now I think I'm gonna release a version without the graphic design to see to see how it goes, and also because I have a financial trouble at the moment, so <laughs> I cannot pay for a graphic mm. designer. So just to say, yeah, go ahead. Uh, don't don't be scared and uh, uh, go ahead, do it. Um, yeah, we were actually talking about uh, legends uh, from Southeast Asia with uh, another guest on this cycle, uh, Road to Session Zero, Con with ZXU, because I had seen recently a a YouTube uh, sort of short video talking about the, the mythology of the, the Pontiniac. And uh, I think I will invite you to be my second guest uh, when we do a RPG Academy film studies about the 2003 or 13 uh, Pontiniac movie uh, that would be uh, that would be interesting. But it, it's interesting how horror also is often used. It's been used in many countries, uh, especially think of Spain, as a genre to tell stories which the mainstream re doesn't really allow to discuss. Even you know difficult topics. In the case of Spain, uh, it would be the, the topic of. Uh, the Spanish Civil War and so on. So, yeah, our has a lot to to offer. I think uh, in terms of of uh, exploration. So, yeah. is dudes and dice Davao having a, a stand at Session Zero Con? Uh, what's what have you planned for for the event? Um, I this is like a really new scene for me. Um, I'm currently the, like, I'm thankful at least that um, the artist, the, the one that made the cover art and the art within the book, um, it, she joined uh, with uh, the pair, Noble Bear joined me. So uh, we kind of worked on like, um, basically helping each other with our booths. Uh, they kind of used my avatar, they made an avatar of me. Uh, they're also my den kids. Um, I'm really happy for them that uh, they've been going through a lot of conventions showing their art. They're really talented and I'm honored to have been partnered with them countless times uh, for multiple events. Uh, for now, I'm actually uh, dude and dice, like of course I'm going to be representing them with my booth and I kind of want to focus more on like um, getting the story out, like getting more stories told about um, the the Mindanao scene like I really want more exposure for that so I definitely like if anybody drops by my booth I'll probably uh, have some fun discussions about it uh, if anybody does Q and A's I probably might do a mini stream uh, in my Twitch um, during the event just taking in some questions um, and I'll probably uh, pitch a bit of like the events of Dudes and Dice like we have ongoing events. Uh, we have an event on February 7, uh, Nikon. It's uh, it's like a Knights themed uh, non d, &D uh, mini con. It's just a mini con. We decided like we really want to get more people exposed to non d, &D games. So we kind of have those kinds of events. Um, that's for February 7. And then February 14, we have ArcherCon. Um, we have this thing where we kind of celebrate um, like the people in our server like uh, one of the few people in our server who has been there since day one. Uh, we kind of celebrate their birthdays and make events out of them. So um, I think I would just be talking, like uh, I'll just be having a conversation with people and like basically point people to um, my den kids booths because I feel like they're a lot more prepared. They have their game screenshots and whatnot. So like check their art over there and I'll just be like uh, mingling with people. Most likely I'll just be talking a lot I don't be on the stream and stuff. So yeah. And the demo. I have a demo, seven and nine. Uh. <laughs> I'm very curious to see how Session Zero Con uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go. Uh, I'm planning to browse uh, as much as my, my son allows me to uh, browse the, the event stream. I'm I will try to record a couple short interviews and put them together 
in an episode of the release, like I did for CyberConf, a, a French online convention, I cannot meet okay. people in person. I cannot do good conventions, so I can, at least I can go to online conventions. Uh, mm. And I, I got I signed up for for a game actually also. Uh, uh, it's called Mere Gods. It will be run by Tan Chao Han. I hope. Uh, I pronounced that uh, well. Uh, I don't know what I signed up for exactly. Well, I, I know it's uh, yeah, it's a story. I think it's a bit horror as well with local mythology. So I'm very keen to to discover uh, what uh, it will be about. Um, is there something else you wish to talk about? I'm running out of questions, um, and we don't have questions from the chat room today. Um, I'm I'm really curious though, because uh, I I actually want to get to know you more. Like I think you're you seem really cool. I actually read, um, like I, I was like trying to look around, like oh, who's Callum? Like I'm trying to look <laughs> around. I don't know exactly. There wasn't much information beyond like, hey, you're London based, but then you sound like you sound like French, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I kind of wanted to get to know you a bit. Like maybe you could. Uh, like what systems have you run and like I really want to know about this Paris Gondo I like the concept of it it's like um, it's like Mar Marie Kondo like yes the, 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 the um, um, this this spark joy <laughs> so I was like oh my god it's a cool concept um, I, I just wanted to get to know you more uh, uh, I guess well, yeah sure uh, well uh, I French is my first language but I'm not French I was born in Belgium in Wallonia, uh, which is the uh, well, things are slightly more complicated than that, but long story short, is the French speaking part of uh, Belgium. Uh, the other half speak uh, Dutch. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not very attached with the country I was born, so I identify strongly as a Londoner. Uh, I, I started uh, Tables of Role playing games at the end of the 90s. Uh, in a French-speaking environment, so what I explain to people each time is how it was before D&D 3rd edition came out. So it was when TSR went bankrupt and before Ooh. Wizard of the Coast showed up. So it that plus the fact that it was in a French-speaking environment, it was kind of a, a, a golden window, at least that's the way I see it, when D&D was not overruling absolutely everything. Uh, it was much more balanced between games. People used to play different games rather than everyone playing D&D. Uh, the most played game was Vampire the Masquerade. The question was not, do you play Vampire the Masquerade? The question was, do you play Chicago by night or do you play Paris by night? Uh, so I, I thought, nice. in, in my shows, I always try to, to encourage people to try different games because that, that's what I do, because I... I've been playing so many, so many different systems and games, uh, yeah, mainly by not running them, but by being a player. So I don't have to, to learn them too much. I can show up and, and play them. <laughs> and Paris Gondo, yeah, uh, some, I mean, after interviewing a lot of people on my show, the Rollist podcast, which is the main show, and this one, Cafe Rollist, is kind of a spin-off. Initially, it was a bonus on Patreon, which I would record in person with a friend during our, our lunch breaks. But because of COVID, I started doing it online. And since it's online, I might as well stream it. Uh, long story short. So there's the Rollist podcast, which is the main show, which is once per month. There's Cafe Rollist, which is this one, which is streamed and is released uh, with a backlog of three months on the, the feed. Uh, there's the RPG Academy Film Studies, which are about reviewing movies through the lens of tabletop. But uh, after interacting with so many designers and people who release their games, I thought oh, I could do something. And one day I had the idea. Uh, actually, it's funny. If you listen to episode two of the Rollist podcast, it's mm -hmm. on the record like the first or second time that a friend told me about Marie Kondo. It was before, so it's recorded. It's in the show. Episode two, we already talk about Marie Kondo. And it was at the time of the book. Uh, there was no TV shows yet, or at least not in London. And when I was in, exposed to that, I thought, you know, um, my wife got a copy and I started reading it. And uh, I mean, I respect the idea behind it. But when I read it, I was like, it's so easy to make fun of. Not, not in a mean way. But if you just distort, you just turn it a little bit, the intensity, 
it becomes uh, hilarious and senseless. Like there's a section <laughs> at the beginning with clients who say, well, there are quotes from clients like, wow, I cannot believe all oh, getting rid of that thing changed my life. And I was like, that's great. What if it's Bilbo from Lord of the Rings who says that? <laughs> oh, that's a genius. Oh, Steph, oh, I, I'm getting along much better with my husband now that I'm t- tidied my, my space. Cersei Lannister from uh, Westeros. So, so yeah, and, <laughs> and then, then I got the idea, well, if it's this, what, what game it could be? And it became this game where... Uh, Paris Gondo, so it's not Marie Kondo, it's Paris Gondo, it's a uh, uh, non-gendered being without a body, because one day they realized that their gender and body did not spark joy, so they, they just gave it away, so they no, they just have a floating thing through, going through dimensions, and they advise adventurers on how to manage their inventory, and and the game is, you start at the very end of uh, the adventure, you defeated the boss, you're at the end of the dungeon, you got some loot, some treasures, which you're gonna create, that's the large part of the game is to create those objects, and you need to decide what you're gonna keep, because you cannot keep everything. You got your starting inventory as an adventurer, I know if you're a rogue, you got two daggers, a rope, a leather armor, and suddenly you're like, well, wait a second, because I found this glittery top hat with blades wiring on it so i'd like to keep that but i don't have space enough i cannot carry everything so i'm getting rid of my first favorite dagger and second favorite dagger to keep the hat and the question is how emotionally attached are you to those daggers and depending on your choice you will have more or less chances to survive the journey home and once you're home to be to have a stimulating and invigorating experience for the rest of your life if you if you yeah if you pick the the right object but yeah i've run this something like 25 sessions now for around 100 players yeah that's awesome and and it's really interesting i mean i really like it i'm very proud of it i'm trying to, to publish it now uh i've got an editor we should start working on that in February. I cannot wait to announce who it is because that's someone who actually worked on <laughs> much bigger projects. So I'm quite proud of hiring him, uh, but it's not confirmed, confirmed. Awesome. Then, then uh, I, got, I got art I want to purchase. I only know where the art will come from. Uh, there's this artist who already did a lot of art, which I can just buy. I, I don't need the artist to create more art. I just need to buy existing art from this artist. And the graphic designer yeah. who was very good also. So so yeah, but it's funny how how stories can come out and how you find out things about the characters through their objects. Because you only create the objects. The, the characters don't have stats. They just have stats because of the objects. They, but that creates a, a whole story of, of different things. So... So yeah, I'm very excited about it. And if if you want to to try running it or play one game, I, I would love to. I, I actually um uh, when I read it, the the sound bite of like in Diablo two or like Path of Exile was bumping in my head, where it's like, um like I can't carry anymore. <laughs> like that was something I kept hearing in my head when I was reading it. Like oh my god, like I want to do a Diablo s um storyline like it, it would fit because like you know like the mechanic of that game is like you try to grab as many things as you can and then it kind of rejects stuff if you can't carry anymore so i mean like when i saw it it's like this is something i definitely would try to run for the kids and you know like they kind of have a thing for item hoarding <laughs> so um it'll be a good lesson in, uh, it's like a good lesson slash uh, experience for them like what can you keep what can you not keep um, and the sparking joy. And I really like the concept. Like, if ever it does come out, I'll definitely support it. And um, you mentioned uh, films, like a film school. I definitely would love to be part of that. Like, yeah. that's going to be so exciting. Yeah, I'm trying to plan a, a lot, actually, of film studies at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm slow editing. Actually, I was thinking of, of one of the episodes. The next episode is going to be out on February 8th. 
and uh, I hope I, I don't say anything uh, inappropriate, but uh, <laughs> one of my guests, uh, they are uh, B Zelda from the Broadsword. And the, the movie we reviewed was uh, Black Cat, White Cat, which is a Serbian movie uh, revolving a lot, Ooh. but not exactly around a, a community of, of travelers, of Romas. Uh, it's the bond, border between. But long story short, at one point of the the episode and the movie, there's a character who's a, a mother <laughs> who's very, uh, uh, yeah, Again, I hope I'm not saying anything uh, inappropriate. Uh, it's Bizelda who okay. used that as an expression. Apparently, it's something. Uh, she said that this character reminded her of her brown mom, moms, brown moms, because those <laughs> were moms with, just like you were saying, with the slipper, and they will hit you with the slipper <laughs> if you're not doing <laughs> yeah. things right. But at the same time, they're extremely loving and caring and there for you uh, when you are thinking. So when you were mentioning that, I was like, that's that's so interesting because we've got this character, this sort of archetype in a Serbian movie from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Central slash Eastern Europe. Uh, that character is picked up as something of interest by Bizelda, who is a, a black individual uh, in Canada. And then you bring that up again, uh, being from the Philippines. So long story short, that's an archetype which is in all cultures, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. The the shangla is universal <laughs> <laughs> for Asians and everyone. Um, it's it's like when you see the shangla, it's like oh no, I I, I goofed up. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I I totally um resonate with it. Like um. Like the I'm a, I'm a very nurturing type in a sense that I I would I love you but I don't want you to go down that path that is very problematic like if there's if I have the power if you respect me enough that you you're willing to listen to me and I and I can like tell you like this is not exactly like there's some kids who like um they they have like problematic um family situations which i can sympathize with and like them seeing me as like a very like you know you're a lot better than my mom and like oh no <laughs> like um i i try to um try to instill that there there are like that you don't have to see mother figures as a bad thing like it's also my way of doing that as well that um there can be caring mothers who who will tell you it's wrong and it's not exactly good that they they punish you all the time. It's not always good that they condone you all the time. There's that balance. So I think um, there there's a good in that archetype, I believe. Yeah, it's. I, I guess it's an archetype. You know, when you think like of the first uh, sculptures that you find, it's this very motherly figure of uh, I don't know what it's called in English, but yeah, that that tiny stone statue of a woman with very motherly uh, attributes. So yeah, I guess it's it's around here everywhere, and it's it's tough. I mean, we're going through different ti difficult times. Uh, I'm a father, and becoming a father also shown some light on uh, my experience as a, a son of a single mother, and how much how much pressure uh, that might be, and how much how much as a parent you take, yeah, you shield your children from. Uh, from the world and at the same time you are a human being yourself and it's uh it's difficult to to cope with uh Hello? everything what is going on oh I'm sorry you faded out <laughs> um oh, sorry i just heard that you're trying to shield yourself from the kid and then disappeared i was like oh no my connection went to zero i don't know what happened but i, I did I, I did hear most of it just got cut but <laughs> okay. yeah um yeah, i'm just worried for that's this kind of yeah, it's, it's all good though. Um, the one thing that makes me like, I feel like I want to discuss as well, like being as you're a parent and I'm like a social, I don't, I don't know what to call it. Social, it's a social parent. <laughs> I'm a social parent. I don't know uh, what to call it. Like a emotional parent. I, I can't put what, my, what kind of parent I am, but I am kind of like a parental figure. I kind of wanted to talk about like, you're in this hobby. I'm in this hobby. Um, what, like, and I, you mentioned you had a kid and I have kids. Um, what are like um, the things that you've experienced 
like in, in the community that you kind of want to shield your kid from experiencing? Because I have a lot of stories about that. <laughs> uh, so I want to hear yours. Oh, mine. <sighs> hmm. It's, I mean, it's, the, the hobby is in the context of society in general, uh, we live in a society, but uh, where and when I started, things were much more toxic. Um, I mean, the, the sort of match, on one hand, it, part of that experiment match what you describe, a sort of toxic masculinity, gatekeeping, um, yeah, it's it's a bit weird, but when I started, there was a lot of not ill-intended, but yeah, it's sort of a power relationship between the game masters and the players, and sort of a a philosophy of uh, what's cool is struggle or you're sh facing difficulties, so. Game masters tended to be harsh on their players, not really abusive or again ill intended, but they saw that as the way. And, and I'm saying that in a past tense, but actually, I played with my first game master not too long ago and I left the campaign <laughs> because I was like, okay, it turns out you're still playing the same way. Uh, the other players love it, so it's a question of taste, but. Yeah, I was like, mm, no, I'm not a not a fan uh, of that. Uh, beyond that, specific things, I guess I guess it all come down. Yeah, making things much more easier to to find and integrate and express your feelings regarding what is going on and your taste. You know, it doesn't need to be hard feelings, but even soft feelings, and be more open about that. I think. Tabletop could be a very positive place for that. I don't think it's always been the case. I think probably it's not always the case, but I'm I'm somewhat optimistic uh, about about the community. At least, yeah, being part of clubs in London and uh, seeing all things are online. On average, I think we, we're on the right path. But uh, what about you? Uh, what would you like to shield children from uh, in the the community? Yeah, you know, one thing you mentioned that I actually like 100% agree with, like with all the things you said. I've agreed to all of it, by the way. Um, like, um, you, the, I like the community, like the hobby community, the Dungeons and Dragons community, um, uh, specifically the fifth ed. Um, seeing that uh, there's been a lot more accepting, um, there's a lot more acceptance to the kind of players that get in, the kind of stories that are being told. I'm very happy about that. And there's a lot of communities built around this system that you can partner with. Like, it's so easy to work with them. It's so easy to, like, uh, like the groups from, like, RPG Sabu, Greasy Snitches. Um, there's also, um, like, uh, Mr. Bear's Cavern. Like, there's a lot of groups within groups that, you know, you can just reach out and then, like, hey, um, back then you couldn't do that. Like, I like I felt that I was like in that I'm, I'm glad I was at the end of that era <laughs> like I was at the time where I started when they started putting out 5e but I was able to experience like two years of that kind of thing do not want that when um, I started with the community um, one of the few things that I, I suppose like I would shield like in a sense shield or like at least protect the kids I want the place to be a safe space. Like that's definitely the number one thing. Like I am, I am willing <laughs> to to like like protect as much as I could if that means that the space that they're in, where they're playing, where they're talking about their characters, won't be like they won't feel violated in a sense. Like if I have a kid who wants to be a girl, that's fine. That's that's something I want to provide for them. I don't want them to have to feel like oh you, you can't you can't be a girl like i don't want that to ever happen i also like there would be times when they would share a lot about their characters i don't want them to feel like they they have to be a certain way just to enjoy the game like what you said games can be a positive experience and like that's something i always aim for so it, the the first goal is a safe space 
and like I would hear some kids like when they come to my uh, community they're already like disillusioned because like oh my previous group was you know um they called me certain things because I play characters this way like uh, I played a flirty character now I'm a whore and I'm just like what <laughs> like that kind of harshness from other communities I, I I don't get that from other groups I don't think it's a community per se. like those close groups that have those like something that they can work out in like they, if they can realize that there's something problematic that they can fix but like you mentioned there's some preferences and stuff but um hearing those kinds of stories from the kids that are under my care now it's like I'm more than willing to like um, defend them for like any kind of like uh like problem they might encounter within the community like they feel uncomfortable because uh someone questioned their gender like I'm more than I'm more than willing to like make sure that it's a safe space but not to the point that it's harsh there's going to be deliberation and stuff but yeah that's the first goal definitely like you want to make sure that they're never they're not going to feel like the world is going to be mean <laughs> that's not going to be something we can avoid for the kids but at least when they get to play they don't have to think about those things like to an extent that you know it's going to worry that's going to worry them for the rest of their life like it's always going to be like when they come out of a game they're going to feel great about themselves they're going to feel confident they're going to want to be um the version that they want to be when they're interacting with people like be their be the best of themselves yeah so, like, that's yeah the the, the thing I, I i sometimes wonder is not limited to the ttrpg community uh, uh regarding children is uh on one hand, you need to to stop bad behaviors and protect each other from bad behaviors. But also, it's uh, I, I'm I'm wonder, you know, as a kid and as a teenager and even a twenty something, I did a lot of bad things. I did a lot of mistakes, and I probably hurt a lot of people unintentionally. And it was not, never really really addressed. So it would have been probably better if those things were were addressed. Uh, but I. I the added dimension is that when I think about my kid and kids these days, I'm, I'm concerned about the record of their own mistakes. Uh, so on one hand, uh, I think we need yeah. to all own our mistakes. On the other hand, uh, uh, it scares me for children nowadays how much something they might do today because they're, they're trying to figure out a life which is very difficult. Uh, and uh, they're going to make mistakes terrible mistakes yes. how much yeah. these mistakes will stick to their boots their whole life uh because there's a record of that uh i mean not even necessarily mistakes yeah. but even uh you know you change from uh, in in belgium you you study till the age i don't know of 12 in primary school then you move to uh yeah. secondary school and then you go to to university or whatever it's called uh, I didn't go to university, but uh, but each time is sort of an opportunity to reinvent yourself a bit, uh, you know, uh, and free yourself from other bullies or maybe stop being a bully yourself because you, you were in that space as someone who tried to defend yourself. But yeah, I don't know what it's like nowadays if you move to the university or the other one and, and you can still be in Googled and they will find that that video you made or this chat room where you, you yeah. said stuff. So yeah, because it's to come back to the tabletop RPG community. I had a very, very close friend who did something very terrible. And on one hand, it was deserved what he deserved, what, what happened, I guess. Although, you know, punishment didn't solve really uh, stuff. Uh, yeah. But I was scared to see how, something which was very central to his life, which was all group of friends and tabletop, suddenly was snatched mm -hmm. away from him. It was gone from his life. It, it, it was like he was dead. And I've seen people online who are podcasters, streamers, game designers, for a spectrum of reasons. Reasons which are absolutely terrible and it's, you know, that's the way we have to deal with it. There's no other way. But there's a whole spectrum going towards things which are not as bad. But seeing them cut off entirely from the community, I, I cannot help yet yeah, to think, what if 
someone I care for, uh, has that happening to them? What if I do a mistake, I do something, and suddenly it's gone. All of this is gone. My my hobby, which is more than, than my hobby, it's my friends, it's my community, it's uh, what I do to, to keep afloat mentally as uh, I'm going through difficult times. What do I do if it's snatched away from me? And it's so easy to say, well, we're going to get rid of these people, we're going to push them out. And and sometimes it's, again, for very good reasons, sometimes for some one doing something terrible on one instance, uh, I find that scary. And uh, I'm not yeah. sure how to, what would be the best way to, to deal with that. And yeah, I guess it's a discourse I'd like to hear, but yeah, it's yeah. a very difficult discourse to have. So uh, I haven't seen it anywhere. And I, I really don't feel comfortable like throwing it on Twitter or something like that. Oh, yeah, um, like, oh, sorry, the, the conversation was brought up by this, but I'm happy we got to talk about this, and, like, I agree on all aspects, like, um, I will admit, like, the online culture, right now, especially in Twitter, which is why I don't have Twitter, <laughs> like, you were asking about my Twitter, I was like, no. <laughs> so one of the things that I don't like is, like, there's a public spectacle for, like, a, for, like, a character guillotine, I call it like a character feeling like hey step one step all this is this person did a bad thing like punish him or like every time his name gets brought up bring all the bring all his sins as if you've never done that kind of thing um i find that it's amplified to the point that there's like where's the redemption arc for this person like um there are difficult decisions you have to make for the community as a whole like um, like you want to give chances and give opportunities for the person to change and stuff like that but you know like there's always a difficult decision of like thinking of the entire community the entire group that's relying on you and your decision and if you let that one person stay and continue with the behavior and you know like affect the community as a whole it's always that difficult decision and it's when they're out of it yeah you're always gonna think like how are they because you know they were part of the community it's not like you know they're dead to you which or stuff like that um they they were part of the community and it's very painful that there are people in that get in the community like it's not avoidable that there would be problematic people and i hope they get a chance to work themselves out but i do believe in a redemption arc uh, perhaps maybe not in this space, perhaps in another space. Like what you said, some people go to different places to reinvent themselves. I just don't agree with the the online the online spectacle, like the the mindset right now where it's like, if you did a mistake, it's something you're gonna carry for the rest of your life, you're never gonna change, which kind of conflicts with the human, uh, the human aspect of things, which is we change, people change, people have different mindsets. Um, and those kinds of things. Some stay over time, like some certain traits, but things can be changed. And I, I believe, red, like, you shouldn't throw people under the bus. It's like you're just as human as they are. They shouldn't be too vilified if they can be given a redemption. Of course, there are some cases that, you know, like, it's hard to see that. It's hard to, like, I, I as a maternal self like I there are times that I will be biased that if it's a very difficult topic or it's a very strong offense against the kid it's like it's something I would deem unforgivable but I always hope that in the next life or like after this thing that they would have a change of character like they have to go through something painful to change so um but again uh, the community can help, but the community can only do so much yeah. if the person can't help themselves. And at the end of the day, it's yes. about protecting uh, others. Also, uh, it's uh, it's yeah. it's an extremely yeah. difficult thing to to balance. Well, yeah, on that uh, we're gonna part because I, I really need to go back to my dinner. <laughs> No problem. Thank you so much <laughs> you, for you have a good deal. for joining, and I I look forward. I'm gonna set up that uh, that recording for the RPG Academy Film Studies. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks to Mr. Bytelim who joined us in the chat room. He was the only person today. Uh, oh, that's a dead kid. <laughs> oh, okay. that's a dead kid. Great. Hello, hello. Thank you for dropping by.
so since you're not on Twitter or, or maybe you are in some fashion, uh, where can people find you if they want to reach you or find your work? Um, yeah, um, I uh, there is a Twitter uh, for the community. Um, one of the kids are handling it. Uh, we're just managing it. Like uh, we just managed it last month. <laughs> so um, it's uh, dudes and dice Daval. You can find us there in Twitter. That we usually post events and like projects that we do as a community there. Uh, you can. We're actually having Dudes New Season 2 coming up. Uh, season 1 was an interesting thing because it was done out of boredom. Kids decided to go live and just read about the games and the server highlights. They did interviews. They kind of played reporter uh, for that, which it's quite nice to see that there's a Season 2 now. And we're doing like a better production value uh, for that one compared to just the live. We're just reading stuff and there's like, um, shenanigans that happened in the live. So, um, so is that on that Twitch? That will be in YouTube. Uh, we have a YouTube. Uh, it's Dudes and Dice Tabletop RPG Dabao. It's, it's a long name, <laughs> but uh, we wanted to put it all there. Uh, we also have a video there of Con Save that happened in December. So it's it's all there. Uh, we're planning to put more uh, production videos, like VODs is what they call it. Um, in the YouTube, uh, there's also two den, uh, do den kids, Seth and Jano. They have a podcast that they're putting up there on Monday. So you can definitely check those out. We're updating the Twitter for that. Uh, the main source of like our updates actually is Facebook. It's all it's Dudes and Dice Laval. Uh, we also have a Facebook group. Uh, we usually post game highlights there. And we have a forever link. We finally, um, like after some deliberation and community uh, discussion we are we opened our discord um versus just um, we tell people to uh, ask for the invite link we are giving the invite link openly a forever link for people to click and join the server um and yeah i think that's about it there's be more updates of the events uh, for my mod i'll give updates on den mother place that's the page that i use and perhaps in my twitch also den mother place i'll give updates Usually it's all about writing mostly in Twitch. Um, the one in Facebook is for my uh, video game shenanigans with Ben Dad. Sorry about that. No problem. I would include links that, to that, that everything you're listing. <laughs> so I would include links to everything in the description of uh, the episode, whether you, if people are listening to that in audio or on YouTube, if you click on it, you will find a link to, uh, to all of that. Mm -hmm. If you could send it to me in the, via Twitter afterwards, uh, via Discord, uh, that would be... Uh, yeah, sure. Be... Totally, totally. Great. Uh, well, I look forward to maybe running into you at Session Zero Con. Uh, whoever watching this, uh, if there's still time, uh, please do rush uh, to join us uh, there. It's free. It's online. It's huge. Uh, there's going to be so many independent uh, designers there. Uh, there's a lovely map. It's going to be... Uh, excellent uh so yeah also please people follow us on twitch uh subscribe so uh, i can grow a little bit my little account uh subscribe on youtube leave comments and likes there uh if you i'm going through uh challenging times uh so if uh, anyone uh enjoy what i do and want to even uh, in the most modest manner uh, support me via Patreon, uh, now is definitely the time. So people watching this, please uh, consider doing it. Even just a single dollar goes a long way to encourage me and uh, help me continue to create uh, content. And if you uh, can do so in just as a one-off, if you prefer, there's also a PayPal me on the website and uh, in the description of this. So yeah. please, people, uh, do not hesitate uh, to to do that. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you around soon. Uh, I will be in touch for film studies. Yep. Uh, thank you as well. And Cheers, bye. Have a great night.